but he was concerned that all men would find God. You see, we get so attached to our methods that we lose sight of our mission. And when the church loses sight of its mission, don't miss this, it's no longer a church, it's a country club. When the church loses its mission, it's no longer a church, it's a country club. It's a place where we all come together and, and we have some things in common and, and we like to sing songs and, and we like food, right? And we invite our buddies over from the country club to, to watch the Super Bowl and to have some more food. When the church loses its mission, it becomes a country club. It's not doing anything great, but we sure like to get together a lot. And if it's not a country club, then maybe it's a rotary club where we even do things that are good because that makes us feel good. But we're not doing it to reach people. We're doing it to feel good. And when we do it to feel good, then maybe we're not a country club, but we're most definitely a rotary club where we're doing some good things, but it doesn't have eternal purposes. You see, Sardis had lost its way. It had a good reputation because it did a lot of good things. But all of those things were self-interest. And they were a country club. You see, we should never lose sight of why we exist. We exist that the world might know that God is alive. That's why we exist. We exist for one reason, that the world might know that God is alive that he sent his son in the form of a man because he wanted us to get it. He was interested in the me message, not the method. He wanted us to get it. God with skin, who died for our sin and rose again. There's a poem, and I didn't even mean to. You see, the church isn't a country club. The church isn't a rotary club. The church is the hope of the world. It is absolutely the hope of the world. Wake up. Strengthen what remains. God's saying, I'm not done with you. He's saying, he's saying you used to have this relationship with me, and, and there was this time where you and I walked together, we talked together, where, where you knew exactly why you existed. There was this time where you knew why you existed. It wasn't to, to make money or to, to build businesses or to hang out with friends. It was because of what I did in your life. But somewhere along the line, you've lost that. And he's saying, but listen, you can get it back because I have plans for you. I have good plans for you. I'm not done with you yet. Strengthen what remains. God's always calling us back to him. You see, and here's the only way that we can strengthen what remains. The only way Christians can remain alive, point three, is through the power of God's Spirit. Without the power of God's Spirit, we are no different than our neighbors who do not know Christ. Without the power of God's Spirit, you do not have the power to overcome anything in your life. Without the power of God's Spirit, you would still struggle with the things that you used to struggle with that you laid before Christ. He took those. He, his Spirit came into you and you overcame the stuff that you struggled with because of what Jesus did in your life. And that is the living proof that Jesus is alive, that He is able to overcome the things that you were not able to overcome. That's the power of God's Spirit living in us. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Here's what's interesting about that. When, when John writes those words, remember and receive, you take those two words and you trace those back to what he's talking about. The Bible's full of remember and receive. But these two words are directly connected to Acts chapter 2. What he's saying is this. Remember what you received. Remember the Holy Spirit. Don't discount the Holy Spirit. In too many churches across America today, we discount the Holy Spirit. We come and we sing songs. We come and we listen to messages. But there is not the power of the Holy Spirit. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I are hopeless. We're lost. Remember and receive. You see, here's the deal. 
The church and its people should never be satisfied by having church. That's not the goal. The goal is not that you and I come together, we sing some songs and we worship. That is not the goal. The church shouldn't be satisfied unless the Holy Spirit shows up. That's the goal. The goal is this, is that you and I, we come together for a reason. What we come together for is to worship the living God and invite his presence into our church. We come together to worship the living God, to come back and say, God, I need you. That God, if you do not show up, if your spirit does not show up, I'm hopeless. I've got nothing. The only way Christians can remain alive is through the power and the Spirit of God. You see, Paul writes Timothy in 2 Timothy. He writes him 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy, Paul's in jail and he's under Nero. And Nero's Roman Empire is falling apart. It is at the um, end of its road and it's falling apart. Nero does not know what to do, so here's what he does. He lets all the Christians in the jail go. He says, go ahead, get out of here. And then once they go, he begins to burn Rome. And he, the reason he burns Rome is he says this. If we let all the Christians go, we can blame the burning on Rome on the Christians. And so that's what he says. He says, see, look, I did something good for these guys, and these guys are burning down our city. But while Paul was in jail, he wrote 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy, they're burning Rome. He says, here's what I want you to do. Go find Paul. And put him back in jail. So they go find Paul and they put him back in jail. And that's where Paul is beheaded. But before he's beheaded, he writes Timothy, the second letter in Timothy. And in 1 Timothy, in 2 Timothy 1.6, he says this. He says, Timothy, I'm about ready to die is basically what he's saying. He says, and this is why I want to remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift that God gave you. You see, when the Holy Spirit entered your life, He changed your life. And that what you and I are accountable for is not just the Holy Spirit. But we are accountable to fan the flame. We are accountable to come back before God and say, God, I need you. See, we keep waiting for God to fan the flame. And he already did. And it is now our responsibility to fan the flame. If your relationship is still with God, then come back and fan the flame. Get back on your knees. Repent. And say, God, we got to have you. That God, that that we don't want to just have church. We don't just want to be a church. We want the Spirit of God to show up so that we can have and be church and behold the glory of God. You see, the church can only be refreshed by the Holy Spirit. A sleeping church can be awakened by the Holy Spirit. And a weak church can be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. And a dead church can even be given CPR by the Holy Spirit. But the only way for life to be breathed back into, the whole, into a dying church is for that dying church to say, God, we don't want anything else but your Spirit. Anything else but your spirit is absolute dirt. This week I was in a conversation with a guy. And God busted me. And I had to say, you know what? I keep defending dirt. And I don't want to defend dirt. I want to see the kingdom of God moved forward in Grand Junction. I want to see the kingdom of God moved forward in people's lives. And when we do anything but seek that, then we're defending dirt. We're defending those things which are meaningless. And we're almost already dead. You see, here's what I believe. I believe with all my heart that the Spirit of God resides in people who are repentant and broken. That's where the Spirit of God resides. You want to know why so many American churches are um, stale? Because just like Sardis, they pretend like everything's okay. And the reason that they're, 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 they're um, stale is because they're not broken. They're prideful. They're, 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 they're um, 
self-righteous. People in churches die because they won't repent. That's the only reason. You watch churches spin into this crazy cycle of, of dying. It comes down to one reason. They will not repent. 2,700 churches a year in America close their doors. That's, that's crazy. 2,700 churches in America a year close their doors. And what happens is that we're so afraid of what people will think, we choose not to confess and repent and become broken before God. Because that is where God's presence shows up. In the brokenness. That is where God's presence shows up. In repentance. Obey it and repent. If you do not, you won't wake up and I will come like a thief in the night. And you will not know which time I come. There is this interesting part on, on Wednesday I was teaching and we're doing a thing called the duct tape life, and the duct tape life is just basically this. It's basically this point, which you and I have the ability to, instead of fixing our life, we have the ability to fake it and act like it was God. Where God didn't do anything, because we wouldn't go to him with our stuff, and so we just, we don't want anybody to know, so we throw some duct tape on it, and we go on, and we just kind of act like it's okay, and it's not. And so I was talking about um, the adulterous woman in John chapter 8, and, every, and, and you probably know the story. The story goes like this, that Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees brought this woman in who was a prostitute who was having sex with this man. And he, they threw her down in front of Jesus and said, Hey, Jesus, you know the law. You know the law, and the law is this. The law is that we have the right to stone her. And, and he said, Yeah, you're right, you do. And they did, and he wasn't just joking around. He was saying, You do. That's the law. And then he says this, and, and you've, you've heard it. He says, so the first one without sin, why don't you throw the first stone? And, and I've got all that. I mean, I, I've read it uh, probably a thousand times without exaggeration. And, and then it says that most historians believe that he bent down. He did bend down. He started writing the sand. But most historians believe that he was writing their sins in the sand. And, and I got that too. I knew that. And that's kind of where my religious spirit kicks in because I go, yeah! It's just like Jesus to make those people look stupid. I love that! Wasn't that great? And Jesus gave me a spin on this story that I had never seen. He said, Paul, I never expose anybody's sin to embarrass them. Nobody's sin is ever exposed so that they would be embarrassed. I always do it so that people would come to me. I was looking for a response from them just as I was her. I was calling her to me, but I was also calling them to me. But you see, what happens in the church is this. All of those guys walked away, and they walked away for one reason. Because they were self-righteous. They were not righteous. You see, self-righteousness, when you get in the church long enough, the church has the ability to make people self-righteous. Where they think they're better than other people. And then when Jesus exposes stuff, they pretend like it's not there. They pretend like it's not there. You see, if we become a church that pretends like we are better than we are, we are doomed. If we are a people in a church who pretend like we are better than we are, then we are doomed. Our marriages are doomed. Our kids are doomed. We're doomed because we're self-righteous. We're not righteous. And righteousness, the word righteousness means to be right with God. That's what it means. Religion has the ability to make us self-righteous. And self-righteousness will always destroy a church. You see, we've all sinned. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glorious standards of God. You see, if sin separates us from God, then it's self-righteousness that keeps us there. That we would pretend like we are okay. But brokenness would get us back to the heart of God. Brokenness and repentance would get us back to God. The reason this church dies is because people want to pretend like things are better. They want to live in phony land. The fifth thing I want you to write down is just this. 
You see, here's the goal. The goal is that we should live in expectation that God will show up. That's the church. You want to know if you had church? Were you expecting God to show up? Did you show up with your family? Did you show up with your wife? Did you show up by yourself just to show up because that's what you do? Or when you came through the doors, were you looking for the presence of God to be there? Because there used to be a day, there used to be a day in the church where the church expected with full expectation that God was coming back. That he was going to change lives, that he was going to restore marriages, that he was going to bring children who are far away in their lives, that he was going to bring them back. Because there used to be a day and a time where the church could not wait to see and be in the presence of God. And that has to be why the church exists. Because otherwise, we're just a rotary club. You see, that's why he says in Revelation 3, 6, and he says it in every message, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. We must live our lives with the high expectation, guys, that God's coming back. We must live with a high expectation that Jesus isn't just good. He's the hope of the world. That's, that's the hope. The hope is Jesus. The hope is Christ. It's way too easy to get inoculated to the gospel. I was working at my house this week, this week, and I was with a buddy, and he was teaching me to do some, some drywall. He's a good drywaller. And as I walked in, I'm getting ready. He looks up at me, and he says, Paul, Jesus is returning soon. And he had this big smile on his face. I went, yeah, that's awesome. He goes, you didn't hear me. He said, Jesus is returning soon. I said, I know. Bill, that's awesome. He goes, no, no, no. Jesus is coming soon. And all of a sudden, there's this thing that welled up in my heart. And I literally went in the other room and just dropped my head, and I just went, oh, God, don't ever get, let me get to a place where I'm used to that message. We should never get used to that message. Jesus is returning soon. And because Jesus is returning soon, there should be this thing in our hearts that says, oh, God, I can't wait. I can't wait. And not only can I not wait because I can't wait, God, I, it's vitally important that I share, share your love with my friends and my neighbors. At what point and what time did the American church become okay with the fact that Jesus may come back soon? Let's go get a burger. At what time did that not become the message? At what time and at what point are we going to come to the place where we surrender our lives and we come broken and say, God, there's nothing more important than your spirit showing up. There's nothing more important than your spirit showing up. I was with a friend, and I wasn't with a friend. My friend was walking out of the building, and I was walking in the building, and he pulled me to the side. And he said, dude, he said, I just got to tell you a story about your dad. He said, he said I've known your dad for years, and your dad...